Hey everybody, it is Richard Harris and Scott Lees with another episode of the Surfing Sales Podcast um, brought to you by Vidyard and Salesforce this month. And we appreciate all their support. If you are looking to uh, figure out something new and different in 2022, be sure you take a look at Salesforce. They're way more than just a CRM and Vidyard is way more than just video prospecting. There's there's a ton of value to both those, to both those organizations and we deeply appreciate their support. With us today uh, is a guy I just met a couple of weeks ago um, and really have engaged with him a little bit. Uh, if you get my newsletter, I, I sent out a survey that he's asking for about some data on AI. Uh, it's Barry Trailer, who is, you know, as self-described, a leader in sales coaching, mentoring, and sales operations, which having gotten to know him, he is. I can easily say that that's true. Uh, but Barry, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. Glad to be here. Yeah. So, so talk to people, you know, a lot of people, if they, if they don't know you, you know, you, you've done a ton of stuff at like CSO Insights, you were at Miller Hyman, you've sort of come in from, from my vision is like this corporate level of sales and sales leadership, but way back when, how did you get into sales? Like what, what pulled you in? I actually uh, always wanted to be in sales. A lot of times, you know, folks will get up and speak at a sales conference and how many folks here growing up thought they wanted to be a salesman? And I would raise my hand. I'd be like one of two people in the room raising my hand. I always thought it was cool. And in, in my, uh, my grandparents uh, had a grocery store in uh, San Francisco. And you know, I remember when I was four years old, um, my grandmother, you know, I'd be standing in front of her and, and people would come in and she'd have her around. She'd, you know, give me one of those knuckle rubs on my head saying, this kid's a natural salesman. And I thought that was the greatest thing in the world. And, uh, and I should have just stuck with that. You know, I, I started, uh, I got a Christmas job when I was 12 working in men and boys shop in retail. And I sold magazines, uh, you know, on, on new birth leads and sold encyclopedias door to door. And I, I was having fun and making money and and bought this you know you've got to get serious and get a degree so became an engineer and and that was like the biggest detour of my my the biggest wrong detour of my life i think, so, I think all uh, salespeople, good salespeople have the wrong <laughs> detours right and you know when i finally decided i was you know i was going to be my own man actually i i uh, when i graduated i worked in uh, underground construction for a few years. And then I went into the public sector, uh, worked for a small municipality and, and got my license as a registered civil engineer in California, which is kind of a big deal. Uh, and then I went into the private sector selling engineering design services and uh, did that for almost five years. And it was great, uh, except you know, everybody wanted to call it something other than sales. You know, it's front end work or feasibility or biz dev or whatever. Nobody wanted to call it selling. And I don't know if if either of you know Jim Rohn's name. Did you ever? Oh, yeah. yeah. So Jim Rohn talks about the day that turns your life around. And um, I won't bore you with all the details, but I had figured out a way to sell big engineering projects that was unlike anything any of our competitors were doing. And instead of talking about our engineering prowess, uh, I got really expert at grantsmanship. And so uh, these multi-million dollar project, design projects, um, we would always make the cut because we you know, had a substantial firm and experience and so on. And I would always start the, the presentation the same way by saying, um, the other two or three firms you're gonna to interview today, we've all been to the same schools, we all have the same license and we can all do the work. The other firms are gonna get you a great set of design plans. We're gonna get you funded. Mm. And we killed it. <laughs> One, two, and the third one, when I heard that we got it, this was over a course of about nine, no, more than that, maybe 14 months. I was working at home that day. And when I heard that we 
had gotten the third one. I was running. I remember running up and down the hill, the hall, uh, screaming and excited and everything. I called my boss. And I said, we got it. And he goes, yeah, I know. And I said, what? He goes, yeah, we heard, you know, this morning or yesterday or something. I'm like, dude, I just found out. <laughs> and he, I said, you know, let's celebrate. And so we, <laughs> there was a, a, a restaurant in uh, San Jose, 17 West. We met there. This is back when everybody used to drink at lunchtime. And uh, I, I, they got there ahead of me. And as I'm walking across the, the dining room, I'm looking and I'm thinking, wow, something must have really gone wrong. Because there was like, there was like no celebration. It was just really quiet. And uh, so I sat down. And I'm listening and they're all concerned now because we got this job, you know, now we're going to be crushed with yet another one of these big projects. And I had ordered a bottle of champagne and they poured it all around. And this is the first time I've ever told this story publicly. And, uh, and so uh, after it was, it was, uh, you know, everybody had a glass of champagne. I said, well, we need a toast. And my boss said, you're right. Here's to Bill. And Bill Smith was uh, going to be the project engineer. And uh, Bill Smith, you know, he, he had getting this job like, you know, the figurehead on a ship has someplace, something to say about where the ship is going. Uh, and I just, I was like, I, I just couldn't even believe it. And I said, here's to Bill. And we all clinked our glasses and, and I, I shot down the whole glass of champagne and I said, got to run. And they said, what? You just got here. And I said, yeah, no, something came up. I got to leave. And as I was walking out of the restaurant, all I could think was, you know, this isn't public TV, but I won't say that, you know, F this. And <laughs> that was the day that turned my life around. Bingo. Right there, right then, married, two kids quit my job. And the only condition for the next job was it had to be straight commission. The only can say the next thing, the only condition was what? It had to be straight commission. Right. And wow. the reason for that, I've never been a money guy, but the reason for that, you may be a great guy. You may be a team player, but you know, if you did your job, you get paid. And if you don't get paid, you may be a great guy and all that, but you must not have done the work. Yeah, I've been that way ever since. And that was in, that was 40 years ago. Wow. So talk a little bit about, you know, how you, you know, you've worked at Oracle, you've worked at a couple of different places. One of the things I, I, I saw about one of the things you do is that, you know, the sales education foundation, yep. right? What is that? Because I don't even know that people know it exists, at least yeah. in our crowd. Probably right? didn't. So, so um, I think these are still pretty uh, current stats. There were um, three three thousand four hundred and sixty-two colleges. This, I'm, I'm going to give these stats from about three years ago. There were three thousand four hundred and sixty-two colleges and universities in the U.S. And at that time, thirty-five of them gave a degree or a certificate in sales. And I would say today, maybe that number is up around one hundred and eighty give a degree or a certificate in sales and they just don't do it. And yet what's interesting is the schools that do like um, University of Ohio, Baylor, uh, there are a number of, of schools now that are active in the program and active in the sales education foundation. Um, they have uh, graduates getting signing bonuses. They've got like a hundred percent hiring rate when they get yeah. these programs because they been exposed to sales training, they know how to yeah. prospect, you know, it, it's really, it's what a, very, very, what, a, what, a, what a ridiculous gap in our education uh, system, the fact that sales has not been taught. I mean, when, when any of the three of us who are at different decades, I think, none of us even had the opportunity to take a sales class, let alone have a certificate or a degree. It was not even an option, not even an option, right? Yet more people leave school and end up in sales jobs than any other role. Well, we can talk about this for the whole hour because this is my whole thing. It's literally my purpose. I, I, and I'm happy to riff on this for our entire time. 
um, well, let's in keep engineering, going. I would actually go back to, I graduated from SF State, and I would go back to the Engineering Society, and I've done this at a few other, down at Santa Clara and a few other uh, universities as well. In engineering, you graduate in engineering, you're an engineering graduate. And then if you pass this eight hour exam, you're an EIT in engineering training. And then after a couple of years of supervised practice at a minimum, you get to take the registration exam and you become a registered civil engineer. I mentioned that earlier, blah, blah, blah. So guys get out of school, folks get out of school and they get a job and they're working. And the whole thing in professional service firms is billable time. Okay, it's all about billable time. And if you get over 80% billable time, you're in tall cotton. I mean, you are printing money. And if you get over 86 or 87%, you are like killing it. And so it's all about doing the work, doing the work, doing the work. And you become a, you know, you're a, an engineer, a engineering C or an engineering B, and then you become a designer, and then you're a senior designer, and then you become an associate. And for the first depending on it, you know, your trajectory, anywhere between five and 12 years, 15 years of your career, it's do the work, do the work, do the work. And one day they say, get the work. It's like, what? <laughs> what? If these are people 15 years into their careers who have done well and who are considered, you know, skilled. And all of a sudden it's like, hey, I didn't, do all this work to become a salesman. Can you imagine the can you imagine the flip side of that, Richard? Imagine that you're a salesperson for 12, 15 years and all of a sudden your boss was like, okay, sweet, go code this thing now. Yeah, go yeah. do the work. <laughs> yeah. Go do the work. Right. Yeah. That's like there was uh there was the, the UPS ad where the, the two sales reps are in front of the guy and they're saying, Yeah, you got to do this and logistics and and uh, supply chain and all this. And the, the guy sitting behind the, the desk, and, and these are like consultants, not the UPS reps, you know, they're consultants. And, and uh, the guy sits back and has this hard look on his face and he, and he leans forward and he says, okay, do it. And they're like, what? No, we don't actually do it. <laughs> they're walking out of the building. You're like, can you imagine that guy wants us to do it? <laughs> and that was the whole UPS kit. So they, they, they could, they could do it. They could Sometimes I think it. customer success thinks that's what we do. Hey, but anyway, uh, totally the University it. Sales Education Foundation uh, uh, is about getting, you know, practitioners and academics together and, um, and helping spread the word. And they have an annual magazine they put out. I can certainly uh, send you the link to that. You can post it on your site. And uh, it's really, it's all about this notion Scott, to your point, it's ridiculous. I mean, yeah. it's ridiculous that this isn't out there. And, and the, the, the fact of the matter is it is out there, but in a very limited way. Um, and it should be much more. Yeah. So. Well, hopefully the, hopefully the trend of more certifications and degree universities, you know, continues. And I don't know, maybe by the time my kids are in school or my kids' kids, at the very least, it's like a part of, you know, normal degree and curriculum and master's degree and part of the MBA and all this kind of, kind of stuff. I, I have a question for you around this kind of phrase of like, do the work as pertains to AI. Um, do you worry at all that AI is, is turning the next generation of sellers into a bunch of lazy people who don't want to do any of the work whatsoever and just want to rely on tools to do everything. No, I do that. Tell me, tell, tell me why. Tell me why. I'm, I'm glad to hear that answer. I just want to know why. Uh, because I, I meet a lot of uh, millennials, a lot of Gen Zers, uh, and they are focused, heads down, um, want to use the tools, um, are not threatened by technology. Um, that's not the part that I am concerned about. Uh, I think they're, um, they're purposeful, they're focused, um, they, they want to make a difference. I mean, all of those things are, you know, killer. 
where I think things start to come unwound or at least uh, elevate as a concern for me is um, I think that a lot of the generations who are not on this call, but hopefully maybe will be listening to it, mistake texting and Facebook and um, you know whatever Slack for actually having a meaningful relationship. And I think that um, they are enablers of connection, but they're still, um, the thing that I say is the technology is evolving much faster than our DNA. We are still social animals. We still crave and need connection. And, um, you know, there was a, a young couple, I was in Palo Alto one evening, these, these two young people were standing on the sidewalk, clearly on a date, both texting. And I went up to them, I said, excuse me for interrupting, but please, please tell me you're not texting one another. <laughs> <laughs> so here's an exercise. This is a thing, you know, back pre-COVID, when there used to be sales conferences. This is a thing I used to do all the time. Um, there are, uh, I would have, um, you know, since everybody's interested in best practices and, you know, speaking of, I would have somebody come up on the stage, you know, anybody willing to come up and take a risk here and, and you know, obviously somebody would get up and I'd say, okay, everybody, I want you to see a best practice here. So uh, Scott, Barry Trailer, and shake hands with you. Uh, good to meet you. And, you know, firm handshake, eye contact, all of that stuff. And everybody's watching and the guy's like, yeah, nice to meet you. And I say, everybody got it? He, yeah, yeah, of course. So I said, okay, let's do it again. Uh, Scott, good to meet you. And Barry Trailer, and, you know, give them whatever you like, a cold fish or the dead fish handshake. And, and immediately the person would go, ee, or they'd start giggling or, you know, you've seen that, thing, right? And, and I would say, what, what? You know, and I talked to you, did you see anything different? You didn't see anything different. But the person that I was shaking hands with had this immediate negative response. Now that's not, that's not the, so what here's the, so what is they didn't think about it. It was limbic. It was like that. And there are five reasons people won't buy from you. no mm -hmm. money, no urgency, no need, no desire, no trust. And that last one will kill more deals than the other four combined. Okay. Now here's my question in a high speed, increasingly remote digital world, how do you create that firm handshake eye contact in this new environment? Because the DNA hasn't changed. But the, ta the tactics have, right? The tactics have. And the need for and trust. The, when I talk the, about connection, the need for trust, yeah. the connection hasn't changed. And I would to say, point, yeah, how do I, would, you I would say the speed with which you can make that connection has slowed down because you don't have the, the uh, contact or the face-to-face -face kind of immediate you know, touch, to use your example. So it takes longer. It's like, I got introduced to you. I engage with the piece of content on yours. I shared a conversation or we were on the same panel at a webinar or whatever. It's like all these things warming up to. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. And I, all of those are available. Here are the things that are not useful. Here's me, you know, having a beer bong with my buddies on Friday night. Here are my feet at the swimming pool. Here's what I'm having for lunch. Nobody cares about having that stuff. And, and it, you know, if that's the kind of stuff you're putting out, if those are your digital footprints, then, uh, yeah. yeah, you know. You're, playing, you're, playing, you're playing a different game if that's your digital footprint. Yeah, no, it's stupid. But all of those things you're talking about, people say, wow, this guy seems pretty thoughtful. She seems like she's making really, uh, she's asking good questions or offering good insights. Um, I think that the ability to do that across, you know, basically across the globe, uh, different time zones, you know, different languages, all of that, I think is, is opening up a whole new world. Real uh, quick, I want to, Barry, go back to, it's no need, no desire, no budget, no trust. There's a fifth one. 
What's the other no one? urgency. No urgency. There you go. So um, talk to us a little bit about, because I know you focus on AI, and I think this is part of where your engineering degree supports you, right? Makes us makes you very much smarter than the rest of us. Um, where is AI now? And what do you see coming 12 months, 36, you know, 72 months? Like, where do you see this going? Well, it, it, it's actually, uh, I, I'm happy to respond to that. Um, my partner, Jim Dickey, uh, graduated with a degree in psychology. And uh, he's the one who's really all over the technology. And I graduated in engineering, and I'm the one who's all touchy feely of <laughs> connection. You know, you what, yeah, what, who, who's doing what? The, the good news is we're both um, reasonably good analysts. So, uh, you know, it, it's been a it's been a fabulous relationship. We've been partners for 20 years now. It's just been awesome. The thing that, and, and how this started, uh, we started CSO Insights back in you know, 2002 or three, something like that. We had teamed up before that, but, uh, and he, we were doing uh, surveys. He had started doing surveys back in 1994. Um, and we were phoning people. The first time we did an online survey, uh, with SurveyMonkey was through Customer Think, and um, I think that was in 2004, and it was a whole new world. We went from having like, you know, begging 200 people to take our survey to having you know, 500, 600 people take the survey in a, in a couple of weeks. It was awesome. Um, anyway, CSO Insights got acquired by Miller Hyman in 2015, and we had a couple of year earnout, and um, uh, Byron Matthews, who was the CEO, and Tim Geiser, who was the CMO, went to Jim and said, we'd like you to build us a concept car. And Jim said, uh, Barry is the car guy. I don't know what that is. I said, no, a concept car is that cool thing that you see at the auto show that gets like all the attention and everybody thinks it's amazing, but they never actually build it. And Jim said, okay, what do you want a concept car around? And they said, you, you, know, you decide. He said, well, I know exactly. AI for sales. So he started looking at this in 2015. Okay. In 2015, there were about 35 AI for sales apps. Okay. We just are releasing our 2021 guide and there are over 200 uh, mm. AI for sales apps. And that's not looking at uh, marketing technologies. There are like 17,000 marketing technologies. It, I'm, and I'm not like exaggerating, that's an actual number. Uh, Tim Reister over Corporate Visions trotted out some numbers. If I'd known, I would have looked it up before this. Um, the, and so Jim started speaking about that at the Miller-Hyman conferences, we, and we've been writing about it now for six years. There are a couple of things that would always happen when Jim would present examples of what people were doing. Number one, people would say, I had no idea this was already available, number one. And number two, you scared the hell out of me. Those so what, every is, time. So what, is, what are those things? Like what are the, the things that people don't Those know things, about? so, and, and you know, Bill Gates is famous for saying, we overestimate what will happen in two years and underestimate what will happen in 10 years. What we've said is we think uh, people overestimate what will happen in 10, two years and underestimate what will happen in five years. So your thing about 24, 36, so we think five years is, is the horizon. Um, there are things happening. Everybody knows about chorus and gong where you can have calls, you know, and they'll analyze the call and how much uh, time, talk time you were talking versus, you know, listening and when certain things came up and who brought up price and when was it brought up and was a competitor named and who mentioned the competitor, all that's, you know, that's, that's like many, you, you can have that now. Uh, Einstein and uh, a lot of the analytics, uh, when you look at pipeline management of VSO and Insight Squared and so, I mean, there, there are all yeah. these things. There yeah. is, uh, there's a great line uh, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. There are people who are leveraging this stuff 
and we have examples um, online. Um, one on call coaching is on our website, but I'll just put a quick plug in here. I hope we'll be doing this again in a couple of months. We're going to be creating a YouTube channel, putting all this stuff up for free next month um, on uh, skills reinforcement, where people are basically uh, doing a, uh, a presentation and the brain shark has this uh, product now that will grade everything about your presentation and play and pay, play it back for you. So it's a huge skills reinforcement uh, opportunity. Um, uh, one of the ones uh, we, we had, um, it was a bank down in Texas. They had 2 million contact records. You may know, you know, like commercial banks uh, have like 16 products and the average customer is using somewhere between two and four of them. Uh, so this bank had 2 million client contacts. They fed into AI and analyzed them all, scored them all in, you ready? Four hours. <laughs> it gave them a score between zero and a hundred. Here's why they scored what they did. And they said, okay, uh, we want our, our, our banking officers, our lending officers to only call on those that scored 80 and above. And here's why they scored, you know, 80 and above. Call on them. And in doing that, uh, their lead conversion increased like 236%. And so Jim, you know, we wrote this thing up as a case study. And uh, then Jim, you know, by the time it was ready to be published and all that had taken some time, he followed up. He said, you know, my handwriting's not always the best. I just want to make sure I've got this right. It was 236%. And uh, the CMO said, well, yeah, that was last year's number. And Jim said, well, what's this year's number? He said, uh, 374%. And he said, what did you do different? And this was the amazing answer. We didn't do anything different. The program got smarter. So this whole thing about AI and, you know, in the same breath, machine learning, it just keeps getting better and better. And that is our message to people is, you know, this isn't two or three years away. This is happening. And that's, you know, we're doing the survey you mentioned. Uh, I appreciate the plug. And if you put a link for that, uh, we've already had several come in on the on the promotion you sent out. Um, and when and when does the AI take over and replace the seller themselves? Oh, I don't. You know, when SFA, when Salesforce Automation came out in you know like 1988, Brock Systems had it first, and then Brock Control Systems, and then there was ACT, and then there was Goldmine. That was back in the SFA days. And everybody's like, and, and everybody fills in the blanks with their worst fear. So the whole thing with Salesforce automation, nobody went, if you know my contacts and you know the opportunities I'm pursuing, you know how to reach them and you know what we talked about last and you know what we're going to talk about next, then what? What's the fill in the blank? Well, then you don't need me. Then you don't need me. Well, yeah. Here's a news flash. We're not looking to fire the sales force. We're trying to hire sales people here. Okay. It's like, here's the real deal. We don't need you to do low level selling work. We don't need you to be a walking, talking product brochure. And so if you watch our video on levels of relationship, also on our website, you know, vendor, preferred supplier, consultant, contributor, partner, ultimately trusted advisor, you know, but we're, anal but we're, we're, we're analyzing pitch, <clears throat> yes. we're analyzing recordings, we're analyzing email through apps like Lavender, which is basically Gong for email. And um, I forgot the one that you mentioned about all the data and the, and the analytics. So, yeah, Insight Squared. Yeah. Insight Squared. And, yeah. yeah, all that. So all these things are, are, are being analyzed. So at what point, and, and this is what I, what I think, and, and I believe, and I don't think it's a doomsday. I think at some point, 
I'll be having a conversation with you on, on this monitor here. And my second monitor will be like a fucking teleprompter, like I'm a politician. And the AI will be telling me what to say to you yes. and almost how to say it based on who you are and all these different data input inputs that I have. So there's not that much thinking that comes from that. It basically just becomes a, a voice actor type situation Could I, be. I i don't i don't think that that we're that many years away from that that kind of situation i could be completely wrong and i've been made fun of and mocked before but i don't know why it won't go that direction well i think that's what the gong and the courses are driving to faster and I, i'd be willing to bet they have some of it um you know i work with a couple of startups on the facial recognition side and bringing that piece in too so that you know it is interesting to see what is the intellect of the salesperson going to have to be in comparison, at least in this world, right? Like in this sophisticated inside sales, SaaS selling world, right? Um, I do think the one thing that, that will be interesting is when the buyer is willing to trust not talking to a human, that's when we'll be replaced, Right. Well, that's already happening. Right. That's, I mean, that's Amazon, right? Like that's yeah. so many places, right? Yeah. How many people so, do you talk to at Amazon? <laughs> right. So, um, well, so, but here's, here's the deal, at least from my point of view. And, and I agree with you, Scott, all of that's happening and all of that is coming. Uh, I see it not as replacing, but as freeing reps. Uh, just like uh, technology, if you look at, you know, we just last night, you know, closed out the Olympics. If, if you look at the performance of the 20, 2020, you know, the 20 slash 21 Olympians versus, you know, the 60s and 70s. I mean, it's just, it's just wickedly more advanced now. It's wildly more advanced. And that is because of all of the technology and training and coaching that has enabled that. And I think it will be exactly the same in selling. This is actually, this is the stuff that Jim and I are working on is, you know, sales as a profession. What are we becoming and what do we want to become? And we think that the kinds of things that are changing, you're going, you're going to move from persuasion to co-creation and collaboration and all of this grunt work you know the grind of uh, you know researching accounts and uh, you know what is their financial performance been how are they positioned competitively and you know that stuff used to take days sometimes months to pull together now, you know there are apps that will pull that together for you this afternoon. I mean, you know, that, that's well, interesting. I wanna... And that I think that what that does is it frees up those cycles. Now, what you do with those, are you playing at a higher level and are you asking good questions? And I think people who can make lateral connections and who are um, uh, can be, you know, both um, detail oriented and at the same time, you know, take it back out to 30,000 or 50,000 feet to see the big picture, business acumen, those kinds of things, I think will be increasingly uh, part of the mix. Thank you. This, this is really fascinating. I want to pull us out of this. We got sort of two questions. Um, one of them will be, you know, what do you want to ask us? But the question I have for you is, as you're doing your studies and you're, you know, looking at the market uh, generationally between millennial and Gen Z, right? What are the, what are motivating differences in their personalities, right? Not necessarily technology, because my guess is they're both fairly equal on the technology savvy side. Um, I wouldn't say that. You wouldn't? Well, I think uh, younger people are digitally native. So I, I don't know if they're more savvy. I can tell, tell you they're much more comfortable. They're much well, that more. I agree with. So much let's say they're digitally native. native. But what, what is, do you see you know, as you talk to sales leaders and they're like, oh, I got to motivate this millennial group versus this Gen Z group. Are, are you seeing anything as, you know, I don't know if you're seeing it or just knowing from your peers, you know, what's sure. that? Sure. So um, 
and I wrote about this in that that column where I was, you know, uh, referencing your recent study, which I thought was fabulous, by the way, on the mental health of sales. And and I'll put a plug in for you on that. Um, I think everybody should download and read that report. Um, the the thing that I said uh, in my column is that uh, I think the biggest difference, Richard, is uh, sort of the end of the the company man or the corporate person. Uh, I think that um, younger people, the you know, let's just say millennials and Gen Z, are interested in and and mean it when they say work life balance. Uh, uh, having work that is meaningful, uh, that they want to do something related to their purpose. Uh, and what I think, why I think it's more similar today than it was two years ago is the pandemic has caused a lot of people to be asking themselves that question and not just young people embarking on their careers, but people who've been at it for 15 or 20 years saying, wait a minute. Um, you know, back in the early Silicon Valley days, if you had uh, three to five years in with a company, it was part of the attraction of high tech back then is you would get anywhere from one to three months sabbatical. And they stopped doing that. And they didn't do it because it was too expensive. They did it because when people have that much time off to think, they didn't want to come back. They, you know, a lot of people said, you know, wow, it, it totally opened my, my eyes. I'm like burning up my life here and for nothing. And I think that um, the pandemic, uh, you know, we had the great recession in 07 and 08 uh, or 08 and 09, we had the great pause last year and right now they're talking about the great resignation there are lots of people just do you think there's a generational difference between those two generations do you think that they're motivated differently between well sure they're in a different place in their life I mean, you know, i'm getting ready to retire there are people whose kids are out of college and the people are just getting started trying to buy a home so yeah i mean you know they're in a different place one of the things what's interesting about that to me let's just stick with that example for one moment uh when you look at sales sales as a career if you don't buy the this will be good for your career speech and go into management if you just kept selling and got better and better and said no i want to stay in my territory you know i want to keep doing what i'm doing the response has always been well okay scott you can do that but you know what that means you know higher quota and you know good luck and it's like same same comp plan same benefits for a guy that's getting, you know, his kids are out of college and somebody who's just got out of college. I mean, really? Is that as creative as we can be? That's the best we've got is, yeah, same plan for age. I mean, just for starters. I mean, that's just for openers. So what so we always sort of turn it around to you and, and a quick shout out to uh, Salesforce and Vidyard for sponsoring us. But, you know, what questions might you have for us? Well, I, you know, I think the things we've been talking about um, when, you know, I, I love your surf and sail. I mean, it, to, that feels like work-life balance to me. And I'm, I'm curious uh, how people respond to that. And, um, you know, if, if, if that's, you know, just kind of a clever title or uh, if, if you're finding that people increasingly are inclined that way, that would be my first question well i think that a hundred percent people are increasingly drawn to experiential type events and kind of deeper connection and relationship building than the the types that are done at larger more traditional conferences um i can't even tell you how many people who've come to surf and sales and have said i didn't really know what to expect but this is like a life-changing event <laughs> and not just because and not because necessarily like they learned here more here than they've ever learned anywhere else but they've been exposed to different things in a different way a different type of thinking a different type of mindset a different approach a different balance 
different levels of success um, and they reevaluate, reevaluate things. Um, and it, you know, we were met with some skepticism at, at first. I mean, I, I can think of one person in particular who is very well known in the industry who was like, that idea is never going to work and, and told us, you know, flat out, don't do it. Um, but we also got an overwhelming response from people that, that was positive and, and continues to be positive, um, you know, to this day. And it is 100% a way for me in particular to marry different passions. I love surfing. I love traveling. I love selling. I love leadership. How can I get paid to do all of these things at once? Right. Um, and the idea itself was born because Richard and I were in Costa Rica over Thanksgiving with our families, just disconnected in a different kind of way and, and thinking, right? I don't think we would have ever thought of that if we weren't down there having this kind of shared experience, so. Well, I'll just comment on that since you mentioned Salesforce. They're a client of ours and we're part of their analyst group. Um, a number of years ago, they uh, asked me in uh, to speak at a, at a dinner about innovation. And um, uh, whenever I think of innovation, I think of Steve Jobs. And so I you know, read the Steve Jobs biography and he described Apple as being at the intersection of technology and social science. That's where Apple resided. And thinking about it, and, and the reason I'm bringing this up is you just talked about it. I believe innovation is at the intersection of purpose and passion. I don't think you wake up one morning feeling smart and say, ah, I think I'll innovate something today. <laughs> I think it's more, you know, a dog yeah. with a bone. You just can't let go of this thing because you're so passionate about it. And at some point, you know, your purpose and passion overlap and you innovate exactly what you did. You know, you, you think in a different way. And what was interesting to me, uh, the next time I was giving that talk, you mentioned Richard early on my time at Oracle. And the first time I presented Sales Mastery at Oracle, one of the things I always say, you know, there's this, there's this huge lie that has been told and repeated over and over and over to sales reps, which is good number, good sales rep, bad number, no donut. You are your number. And the room exploded in laughter when I got up and said, you are not your number. The room, they, <laughs> if, if they had had squirt guns and, and toilet paper, they would have been throwing it at me. I mean, it was just, I mean, everybody just, they couldn't stop laughing. And, and you are not your number. Your number is a reflection of what you do and how well you do it, but it's not you. And you take, you know, your cool car and your cool house and your cool whatever away and you're still here. Okay. It's not you. So what are we doing here? And the thing that got almost as big a laugh line was, I believe business is just an excuse for us all to hang out together. I love that. That's good. <laughs> and, and everybody laughed at that. It's like, oh, you're from California. It's like, yeah, born and raised. It was about three years later, after giving that talk a few times, that I finally realized there's another question. It's like, hang out together to do what? And I think the answer is to do good. That's where the purpose comes in. Okay. And if my whole deal about sales mastery, you know, um, Nielsen did a thing and, you know, who's trusted, who's not. And, and you can look this stuff up online, but you know, like doctors and, uh, and ministers were like number one. Ministers have probably slipped a little bit about that. But number 19, tied for 19th place, were sales reps and politicians. Okay. Now, you know, as an engineer, 
working in the back room, you know, I probably would have an opportunity to meet, you know, two people a month as an accountant, you know, as, as a lot of things as a seller, you, you know, you get to meet two people a day, you get to meet two people an hour. Imagine if we were able to raise the perception of sellers to first or second place, what a different world we'd be living in. If, if, if we took all that nonsense about, you know, glad handing and bullshit artists and snake oil salesmen, and how do you know when a rep's lying, his or her lips are moving. If you took all that crap and just threw it aside and said, win-win, collaboration, co-creation, connection, communication, I can't win if you don't. You won't win if I can't. When we finally figure out we're actually in this together, imagine. That'll be hey, that could be a song. <laughs> Scott, Scott is the musician between the two of us. So, X. Uh, so that's great. what I think. That's And that's why I don't think AI is going to replace it because AI can can analyze stuff, but AI has no judgment. AI has no intuition. Yeah. AI, AI has no soul. So I, I would agree. And uh, I'm not worried about it. Yeah. Well, thank you, Barry, so much for joining us and really like going deep on a topic that I think a ton of people think about, curious about, may not research it or know where to research it. So yeah. we really appreciate it, Barry. Thank well, you for your time. Pleasure. Yeah, thanks so much. No, it's, I've enjoyed it. it. went pretty quickly here. I did a lot of talking. Um, I'll, I, again, uh, if you can, uh, anybody who's interested in taking the AI for sale survey, and you don't have to, it's it's people who've implemented AI, people who are considering it, or people who looked at it and decided against it. It's a three-minute survey, uh, whatever camp you fall into. Uh, I'll also send you the link for the Sales Education Foundation. Uh, cool. I'm really delighted you brought that up because um, it's just... It's a great organization and, you know, it addresses this thing we were talking about early on, yeah. uh, actually getting people trained, educated in this stuff. Yeah. Unlike all of us. Awesome. <laughs> Unlike all of us, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Barry. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Great meeting. Thanks for having me in, guys. Enjoyed it. Bye-bye.